good morning. It's nine o'clock. We're going to go ahead and start our meeting. Okay. We need to have a roll call. Yeah, definitely. So, um, board, uh, do we have Arlene Tortman? Yes. Jean Christopher? Here. Lauren Selly? Here. Um, and then uh, member absent, uh, Tom DeVee? Yes. And then um, staff, we have uh, Molly O'Donnell? Here. Lisa, Lisa Gallinor? Here. Kendra Daniels? Here. Katie Pug. Here. And we're just missing um, Carol Dominguez. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, does anybody have the time to read the minutes from the last meeting? If so, I need a motion to approve. Motion to approve. I'll second. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Minutes approved, passed unanimously. Okay, my name is Arlene Zortman, Jean Christopher, Warren Soleil. How do I pronounce your name wrong? Sally, 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 <laughs> Sally. <laughs> okay. um, and it's in public invited to be heard. Um, yes, so we do have uh, three people that would like to be part of public invited to be heard. Um, we have Ronnie Dooley, uh, John Fallon, and we have Suzanne Dunham. Okay. And Ronnie. Who's the other Suzanne. Okay, folks, we're going to give you three minutes, and we don't usually, well, we just sort of let go like the city council does. We give you three minutes to speak, we listen, and then we don't respond back. So, but we will listen to what you have to say. And am I correct here? Yeah. Okay, and so I have worked with my phone this morning since I don't have a watch, and I think I figured out how to do the timer. I, I got it. Okay, good, good. Then I don't have to keep looking at this. Okay, let's start. Lonnie's in there cleaning up. Okay. So, if you want to start with John. Okay. So, John, if you give your name and. Can I be heard from here okay? Or yes, I can, okay. I can hear you. I'm John Fallon, resident here in apartment 117. And the reason that I'm here, I love this place dearly. And I'm pretty concerned anytime I hear and observe negative things going on. Can you stand up, John? Uh, I'm sorry, can you stand up? Sure. So we can hear a little better. Okay. Thank you. So I stand over here. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I was saying I love this place very much, and when I hear negative comments being made, it disturbs me a lot. And I have a habit, my wife will agree with this. I'll hear a comment and I'll say, well, it could be this, could be that, could be the other. And I do that about this place because I don't want to see that kind of stuff going on. And I don't want to believe it. But the one thing that rattles me more than anything, Emily, is when residents will say they don't care, referring to the of the Koreans, or um, And I try and do that to the best of my ability, depending on what it is. But one thing that I notice that I think leads to that enormously is the communications. Um, two ways. One, we hear changes are going to be made, and then something else happens, and something else happens, and then the story drops, and we don't even know what's going on. The other one, and this one's much more critical as far as I'm concerned personally, is this is the one that I can sense and feel myself, is the telephones. It seems ludicrous to me when we I go down and I see an in emergency call this, and you call in and you get voicemail, which may or may not ever be returned to. Okay. 
second now, the times that I have noticed that a couple of them are pretty critical, the times that are critical had to do with locks being even, oh, you know, not able to lock ourselves in to have security. Uh, another one was a block that was very, very difficult to open to exit. And the third one um, was one with an elevator out of order. And it was a, I don't know whatever happened with that one. But anyhow, I know it was a long time because I was out there in the lobby with the folks. So my point is that if it's going to be something really serious, I think we need to have it, you know, have it returned and know that the message got through. I've started to become in the habit of, if I call a cop to leave a message, ask, please at least text me or acknowledge that you received this, even if you can't discuss it. So anyhow, to me, I think that's one of the things that really makes me feel yeah, I see why it came back to go this way. So, okay? Thank you. Thank you, John. Are you Suzanne? No, I'm Suzanne. I'm him? Okay. No, Sus I'm not, okay. I'm not part of him. Okay. I have two more people to speak. Oh, okay. I apologize. Okay. All right. Suzanne? <coughs> Thank you. I'll stand over here because it's really difficult for those people here. Okay. Although I've been told I have a rather loud and very simple voice. So, <coughs> anyway, I, I appreciate the opportunity to just say a few words. I've lived here 12 years. Can you give us your last name also? My, pardon me? Can you do Danielle? D U N N E L L. Okay. And I've lived here 12 years, so I've seen a lot. I have a lot to compare with from year to year. And I will say this very quickly, that um, when, this, when it first came, this was managed by a private property uh, management company. We had flowers, it was beautiful, it was lovely inside, everything was kept up. Good morale, I mean, it was just an absolute joy to live here. When it went over to the responsibility of Longmont Housing, it went totally downhill, and it only took about two, three years at the most. So I'm one of those people that said they don't care anymore, because when we have, like down in our main lobby, main big posts, there's all chipped and there's no paint. Uh, when you come in the very front door, it's all cracked along the wall, it was filthy. I had to tell some king people the other day to please clean it. I did. So I guess what I'm saying is that tells all of us when all those columns have been chipped and unpainted at the bottom for three years, and it probably would cost a total of maybe 30 bucks to fix it. But that says to me, you don't care. What would it say to you people? It's not like you're spending big bucks. So anyway, those are my comments. I still live here, not because right now it's a particularly joy, a joy to live here, but because I love the area. And I hope to be around for a few more years enough. I don't know if I'll be around long enough to wait until this thing's renovated. I rather doubt, I bet that we're closer to five years. Because I, as I, when I had my visit with Cameron, I said, just the smallest thing to say that you care. Fix the, the bottom thing here. Throw a rose bush out there. Now we have rose bushes, but you people didn't buy them. You don't spend a dime on them on the outside of having a lawn mowed, and that's only on areas that face Main Street. Now we all know why it's because it faces Main Street, that we have grass. We know why, it's obvious. Everything else is pure dirt with, with uh, tarp sticking up like this where you pull bushes out. That's been probably five years and that's where the entrance that I have to use. It's just all dirt and you know that the plastic tarp is supposed to keep the weeds down. It's been sticking up this high at least about three to five years. Nobody will touch it. Now it might take, I was gonna go out there with a pair of scissors and at least cut the tarp down. But then I got my usual rebellious nature, and I said, well, why in the blank should I? You know? Time's up. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Molly, do you want to hear public? Yeah. Did everybody speak? It's your turn, Molly. Okay. Give us your 
your last name, please? I'm sorry. Monty Dooley. D O O O Y. I think that morale is a little low, and everybody's giving you different ideas of what goes on. Um, I think Kat's got a big job in front of her. Um, but I think we all have to remember that this is a step-by-step -step process. To get her in here, to understand what the job is about, to start taking care of things as far as, you know, the, the immediate needs and then the secondary needs and things like that. I hate to lose her because she's overwhelmed. I really hate it if she got to the point where she felt like it was too much. And I'm feeling like that may be going on, and I think that's partially us. I think that's people thinking that they come first. And if they're upset about something, it needs to be addressed right away. Um, I think that we have to give her some space. We have to give her a chance to get used to this job. She obviously has experience at other properties. Um, I, we have to give her the time to learn this particular property. People say she doesn't understand. How is she supposed to? She's only been here, what, two months at the most? And that's only part time. I understand that she's got four properties she's dealing with. She's got the two here and the veteran's property that she'll be continually using or continually responsible for. But then she has two other ones that she's coming out of that she did work at and she's training someone and she's coming out of that. She's got a lot on her plate. And yeah, I know it's frustrating when we feel like that something needs to be addressed and it doesn't. But I hate to lose her because we all thought, well, I know what's the most important thing that needs to be done. And we hammer at her because I think she's feeling like that. I think she's feeling like she's getting hammered on. And I don't want to lose her. I think she's got, she's got a good reputation. I think she's got good potential. You know, not potential, that's not weird. But I think she has good skills. I think she'd do well here. And I'd like everybody to just think about that and maybe take a step back and give her some breathing room so that she can actually get used to being here, get used to what she knows are the responsibilities of all the properties, and then give her an opportunity to learn what our needs and wants are here at Village Place that need to be addressed. And hopefully they be addressed in a timely fashion. But I just don't want to lose her because she's overwhelmed. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. I'll get the clock in. <laughs> okay, so we did have three people sign up to speak, which comes under our public invited to be heard. At the end of the meeting, if any of you would like to speak, we will cover that at that point. We want to just keep going with our meeting. So um, I don't want anybody to feel like we've neglected to hear you, but we'll hear you at the end of the meeting, which really kind of goes along with what City Council does as well. Uh, okay. Next is organizational updates, LHA Advisory Board member election. Consent this item. Thank you, Arnie. So uh, this is Molly O'Donnell. I'm the Housing and Community Investment Division Director for the City of Longmont, um, including LHJ. So this first item is the Advisory Board Member Election. We wanted to give an update on um, what was discussed with the LHJ Board of Commissioners on July 5th. Um, they did vote to approve uh, modifying the bylaws to change the Advisory Board from a five-member board to a seven-member board. And they also uh, approved allowing us to extend uh, Tom and Lauren's terms for a period of time to allow us to um, hold an, another application period to get more applications to fill the full seven members. Um, so with this, we would be working on a bylaws update, as well, a new bylaws update, because we do need to adjust some language in the bylaws regarding um, having the advisory board election process aligned with the city council advisory board election process. Um, really, the LHA board is a different governing body, and we do think that um, we would like the flexibility to be able to open up those elections when we need 
need them rather than having to wait for the, the two times a year that the city council advisory board election process is open. So um, our next uh, LHA board meeting is uh, August 2nd. And then after that, we have one for uh, in October. It's either going to be the 4th or the 18th. We haven't yet uh, confirmed which day it will be. So uh, by we're going to be checking in out the bylaws to um, make that edit, hopefully ahead of the August 2nd meeting, to be able to have the flexibility on the timing and open it up the application period when we're ready. Um, so I do want to mention um, that the existing applications that we've received will just carry forward into that new um, review goal. So we have not yet fully reviewed those or scheduled interviews because we knew we needed to um, expand our application process to be able to fulfill the full work. Um, so we, I know that the, the advisory board last meeting uh, recommended a motion to, um, or approved a motion to recommend the LHA board to approve Lauren and Tom's terms for two more months. Um, instead of going with that strict two-month period, it's more of a um, as, as soon as possible, um, but your terms are extended for as long as needed to get the new application process out, and whether that's um, immediate, which is our goal, versus December with the city council, that's kind of our end date, um, but we are certainly uh, confident that we can complete this here in the next couple months rather than December. Yeah, so I just I, want to give an update there. Yeah, I think what happened in there is, I think Karen and Temple to in conformance with the advisory board process. Is that correct, Molly? When they did the bylaws originally? Correct. So, it, so it was tied to the same. And we, we just, as we we're making the other bylaw changes, didn't see the, like the, that six word sentence. Mm -hmm. And the problem with it is, um, as I've been talking to the city attorney, is we need to keep the as separate as possible from a functional perspective. So for the same reason that when we're in meetings and we need to run something when they're at a city council meeting, that we go, you need to adjourn as a city council, reconvene as the housing authority commissioners. Uh, the reason we do that is to keep that separation so there's not the conflict in the two roles. And this is, I think, the last piece where that conflict existed. And so, um, so what we want to do is just kind of strike that language, pull over the board, the, the pertinent components of the board piece that, and bring it into the bylaws so that it's within its own bylaws section and we can do it um, as needed because I think the challenge with this board is, you know, when more things are happening and moving and waiting into those two cycles that we have for the city may not be the best approach for us, especially as we're working on projects. So, um, you know, we have a few development projects that are teeing up. If we have some vacancies because people move or something, we need to bring people on as early in the process as we can, and that just is too restrictive for us. So we'll be working on that. Um, normally we would bring that to you all, but because of timing with the Housing Authority Commissioners, um, we're going to need to take it straight to them, which is allowed. So if there's, unless there's any concerns with that, for example, we're going to be moving on. Just to make sure that I understand the process for the, um, the election is that current people who have applied Theirs will still be carried over and mm -hmm. they will not need to reapply. No. Okay. And Molly, I was looking somewhere. The board did say there were certain positions that they want represented. Where was that? Correct. So we updated um, the bylaws already to, uh, to indicate the kind of expertise that we want on the board, uh, both from the resident side and uh, the general community side, and then also from the professional side. So, so that, that's that'll really be part of our uh, evaluations. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a point of clarification here. 
um, uh, in our uh, lining uh, at you know the advisory board uh, positions and, and filling the positions, is there an opportunity uh, that we just keep the application process open? Could you guys speak louder, please? Oh, on the advisory board, is there an opportunity that we keep it open? We keep the application. I don't think we can do that. I, that's why I asked. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. The answer is no. No, we need to open it up when, when the vacancies fill, or when the vacancies get open. You didn't hear the question, did you? Pardon? You didn't hear the question was, can you speak louder? Yeah, we, we the what Gene said in this was that, can we keep the application process open for the boards? And I said, I don't think we can keep it open in perpetuity. And then I think I heard something about for the residents. And so, no, we'll have to open them up as they're, as the positions are vacant and as needed. Okay. So as a position comes open, we're gonna take applications and fill it at that point? I think we have a choice. It's not saying we will do it, but we have a choice as to if we're at a point where we're at a critical juncture, mm -hmm. where if someone is going to come in too late and we're bringing two development projects forward, I think we'll have the choice to do it. It doesn't mean we have to do it. Okay. All right. the board. 
I have a suggestion. Um, uh, I think um, that's a, a pretty broad subject to be talking about. And possibly if we categorized um, quality of life and that um, we focus on particular aspects of it, and I, I would like to uh, involve the residents in determining those categories, and I think those should be addressed at least quarterly. Um, so uh, Molly, Lisa, whoever can now be inundated with, <laughs> with that, but I, I think getting that, starting that from resident perspective would be a good idea, but if we categorize it, we can focus on the issues better. That sound good? Well, we've brought up many, many issues consistently. So how do we do that? I mean, is it writing suggestions or, or what? Is it based on the interviews that were done at the properties? Yes. Yeah, so it's based on the interviews that were done at the properties where people came in and met with everybody oh. to find out what the concerns are. So now what we're trying oh. to is, is activate those goals into a plan. Oh, way back when. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And some of those will be discussed further in. So this is the too late meeting. Mm. Oh, okay. No. In other words, if I have a suggestion, it's too late. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, that's a starting point. Okay. Yeah. So let me add a, one very, very obvious um, action item that will, will address a lot of this is following back up on our resident quality of life, I'm sorry, our resident engagement process. We are still doing that report back. I had intended to do that for this meeting, but we had, we had some um, derailments with uh, uh, staff outages, so including myself. So um, that is something that is still coming forward, and that is going to be a very comprehensive way to um, show the residents and the LHA board that we have um, taken some engagement processes and taken in people's opinions through that engagement process and are and to come up with some actionable items. So that is one very specific effort that will be pretty broad and comprehensive. I guess what I'm uh, more thinking about um, is how to institutionalize that through our meetings and through what we ask you all for in terms of advice and, and feedback. So I think, Gene, that's a great idea. We can, we've got our, uh, we have a standing agenda item about alignment with goals. I can put a subset on that as a standing item about quality of life and then um, take ideas for discussion items for each meeting. And then regarding the, the quarterly aspect, Gene, that you were talking about, is that um, bringing forward a group of residents on a quarterly basis at this meeting, or what, what more specifically were you thinking? Uh, I was thinking of the review on a quarterly basis. Okay, so maybe right. touching back on right. our, our large peer engagement process yeah. on a quarterly basis just to get continual feedback. Exactly, All right. yeah, but we should be getting continual feedback. So are you thinking review on a quarterly basis per facility or at one big meeting with everybody invited? Let's, um, I would defer to Lisa, but it seems like um, doing them all at once would be a little overwhelming mm -hmm. so that we could take our properties and, you know, every three months, village place and uh, different three months would be for stone launch, et cetera. Correct, like yeah. by campus, maybe yeah. every quarter review a couple campuses and their big concerns. Yeah. Hey, can that combine up with the quarterly touch that I'm going to have as we're moving through? So. Correct, and then that will pull into the quarterly walks I'm getting on schedule now, where I'll be walking each property quarterly with maintenance and management. Okay. So we get a big overview and look at projects and all that now that we're. Sure. Staff on the maintenance side that we can actually start looking at some of these um, 
capital improvements and the new fast work that needs to be done over the next seven years. Yeah. It can kind of all roll into one and be like a big progress report on where we're at with all of these things. Okay. So it will be property specific. Okay. Wonderful. We probably need to be longer than an hour and a half. Yeah, within, yeah, all of that within budget constraints. I don't know if I have to always throw that in there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Molly. Um, development and project updates. We've got the Homer vacant land naming process and the request for a, a quote review. So I'm going to get this one started and then I'm going to turn it over to Katie for some of the. Um, the naming process uh, specifics. So first of all, you all received the request for qualifications for the vacant land at Homer Crossing. Um, so if you have any comments on that, we welcome your uh, feedback. Just provide it to us probably within the next week or so, I'd say, because uh, this, along with the naming process, as soon as we can wrap up those two items, we're ready to put this RFQ out on the streets. So um, backing up just to, for an overview, that RFQ we are looking for a development team, meaning um, a, in this case we're hoping for a, a prefabricated manufacturer of affordable housing with to come forward with a uh, you know the development consulting if needed and the just really having a full um, design built included in the proposal from a team. Um, so the, recall that this is about two and a half acres of land over just uh, west of over the existing Carson Lodge at Boulder Crossing. And um, the intended use here is, is family units because we really only have uh, Aspen Meadows neighborhood is the only real family property that LHA has in its 461 unit portfolio and that's only 28 units so we really do see a need um so i'm gonna go ahead and just unless anybody has immediate feedback on their rfq you can go ahead and submit comments to us but first i'll ask that if anybody brings, wants to bring up some comments on the rfq here so i want to jump in with molly so katie and i talked about this last week this is actually an interesting one because I think the RFQ is more intended for us to see what's out there um, than necessarily the traditional approach that we will take. And so, and, and why it's different is because this is not a project that, um, I'll use the spoke, where the county was putting money in, the city was putting money in, and so the county was its own developer and then they were going out and uh, looking for a bid or something um, and so this is really a development partner and so I'm not sure we have to go out for an RFQ on this one but we also don't know what the world is and so this is really to see what the world <coughs> what the world is um, you know it's, it's highly likely we may not get any responses because we we're pretty specific in terms of what we were looking for um, but in terms of this project, what, what we really have in hand is the land, uh, which is under the LHDC, separate entity. Um, and then we have, how much did we put into this, Molly? 1.5 million. Yeah, so we have 1.5 million, which is ARPA, which is the city. And then the uh, housing authority's interest is really the operations and management of this facility. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see what we get. I don't think we're obligated in this because if it doesn't meet what we're trying to achieve with the manufactured housing component, then we could potentially be more direct in talking to folks that have experience in that. But this is really just to see what, what we're not seeing in the world right now. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll see what comes in. So I did have and just one clarification. It's one point three million. Oh, okay. Sure. So I did have some questions, which I will send to you. But a couple of things that um, I just wanted to to bring up now. One, can you just briefly describe what you mean by prefab or pre? 
So what we're talking about is um, last year we had the opportunity to go to Indie Dwell. And so Indie Dwell is actually, it's a national uh, group, but they divide by states. And so they are a manufactured housing unit based out of Pueblo. And they do everything from housing design for uh, homeless to, you know, up to, I would say even attainable at some, at some levels on a price point. So generally what they told us is that their cost of construction ranges from $125 a square foot to about 205 correct Molly? Yes, that's what I recall. And, and so basically what they're able to do is because they're, they're building it in a, a manufacturing facility, they're able to draw the price points down dramatically compared to what you would see in traditional stick built um, housing. And, and so, and what they do is they also use a steel platform. So instead of wood two by fours and things like that, the base of these units are steel, the roof is steel to design on the layering, but it really is just a cost issue and how to do it. And um, so they've been doing this in different places. Uh, when we went to visit, they were shipping uh, several units out to, um, where was it? It was a mountain community. Um, and, and so you have what they do in designing the units. What we're looking for is somebody that has experience on both the architectural side and the development side in terms of working with those units. Um, meaning side layout, horizontal infrastructure, all of those issues, because it is different than normal traditional stick built development and that's kind of what we're trying to see is who are the architects who are the developers that have this experience and working with an indie well in this type of situation okay and i'll, I'll mention that in the arpa funding is is once in a lifetime yeah. funding mm -hmm. um and the, the city has dedicated a good chunk of that to affordable housing and one of the real things that, that we want to do is explore these new methods. Um, this is our chance if we're going to test run something and, and see if this could work for the housing authority in the city. Um, this is our chance. So we really wanted to put this out to kind of see um, if this prefab is a solution that we should be looking at going forward. Okay. Just to mention that if the
couple of things that I had thought about is I know that we've talked about this and, and particularly since these are going to be family units um, is the child care and I don't want us to forget about that. Is that something that needs to be in this original thing or is that something that's going to come at a later date? Um, we talked about I talked about this with Katie. I think it needs to probably come at a later date because this is not a large parcel of land. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to have the architects and developers on board to, to figure out what is the trade-off. Uh, because when you're dealing with a parcel this small, um, you will lose units potentially if you put child care in there. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do that sort of analysis to figure out but you really need your architects and your development team to help do that. Uh, because are you, you know, if you put child care in, do you want to lose 10 units? I mean, that's kind of, we don't know what that delta is in this. And so, paralleling this, um, separate and apart for anything here, we are having different child care conversations in the city. Um, and looking at different partners to try to build that capacity in a different way. I was in one yesterday where um, we're looking at actually multiple partners in a larger child care facility. So we're running child care on multiple fronts, but I think we need a development team to figure out. We thought about putting it in, but it's just too early to tell until you can really start understanding site limitations, parking requirements, height issues, all of those things, that will then start resolving space and capacity of what we can do. I just I just won't, don't want to lose sight of, you know, it's convenience mm -hmm. for the people if, if they've got it there close to them rather than having to go across town. Right. Which is saving gas and, and all of that. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, so I just I don't want to lose sight on that. One of the other things that I was wondering about is, and maybe it's something that comes later, is I noticed that we don't ask them whether or not they have had, within the last five to ten years, penalties or judgments against them that would maybe have some sort of a negative impact on whether or not they would be able to do this. Is that something that is even considered, or is that something that... No, we look at that once we start digging into this. This is a little bit different than a bid. So a bid, you kind of do that. This is, we're just looking at qualifications and then we'll bet based on what we see. Okay. Well, like I said, I think it, it's great that we're moving forward with this. Um, Sunset Campus. Time is set early. But I'm, is, is everyone okay with uh, giving any comments they might have back on the RFQ itself here within the next week? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to move to the, the naming of the property, which this is kind of a fun thing. Oh, and oh hold, on, hold, hold on, hold on. Hold on, Molly. I want to go back to this, to your point and penalties and things like that. You know, one of the things that, that we're really dialing in organizationally is um, finishing on budget on time. Mm -hmm. And and so we're, we're really looking at that information because right now, um, with the financial pressures we're seeing, uh, time is money. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's a significant issue right now. So overall ability to move it is going to be a big thing for us. So yeah, those are all things we'll look at.
we're going to loop in our Markham Day group, but um, ahead of this meeting, they, they weren't available. Uh, they were, had some staff time off, but we will uh, loop in the city's marketing team to check this out once we kind of come up with some, some ideas. But in lieu of that, we, Katie um, and I did some research on uh, some naming processes and we just thought it'd be kind of a, a fun and meaningful way to involve this group. Um, and then we can, you know, for anybody that's in the audience, we're happy to take suggestions as well. Um, so, Katie, I'm gonna let you go ahead and um, walk through our, our naming exercise, the documents are in your packet, so I'm gonna go let her go for it on the details. Can you hear it better now? Yes. 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 <laughs> Posthumously, mm -hmm. um, and there's a various 
good reason why we don't, because you never know what's going to happen. Right. Um, exactly. So, I mean, you just have to, you just have to be careful with that one. Well, in most places, when they're named after somebody, it's because they've contributed millions in order to get a bill. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing when Arlene goes, well, who used to own it? Yeah. And I went, Lila Stewart, and I went, huh, maybe we talked to the Stewart Foundation. Um, I think we would have a better chance of the Stewart Foundation on this one because it's it's family housing. Yes. So so the Stewart's big, the Stewart Foundation's big interest is University of Colorado. Longmont Museum and anything related to family and children. Mm -hmm. And so, and they are, I think, involved in the childcare conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it may not be, so back to your point, when we think of childcare, what we were also talking about is maybe there's a transit component to childcare where we pick up a design locations where we can still get the economy of scale, but we can do pickups. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. That may be, actually, that may be interesting. And Molly, we may want to try to reach out to Jim Newcomb and go, hey, here's what we're doing. She used to own the land. Are you interested? There will come any rights with that, though, because they're really focused on that for the Stewart family. So. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Because, yeah, it would be nice if we could kind of tie that in together with the, the land. Yeah. So that was a good suggestion because it wasn't until you asked me that question that I realized, oh, it was Lila. So that entire area was developed by John Cook, but Lila owned the land. And I think that was related to the radio station itself. So that tower mm -hmm. was connected to the radio station. And that's why a lot of times on the Denver station, you'll hear Denver and Longmont or something. It's because they acquired this station for broadcasting area. So, yeah, let us think about that. Okay. Okay. Good suggestion. Okay. Um, and so I added some other ones that, you know, if you want, we had the crossing, which is a little more for a you know, younger audience. Um, Bluebell Village or Bluebell Place, Chewgrass Place, um, Chewgrass Commons. These are some more kind of you know, just general names, but I think you know if others have names that they want to throw out, we can kind of uh, go through a rating process or however it makes sense. Um, you know, we kind of want to have how this process makes sense for everyone. So I think that at this point, um, if people have hey, hey, Molly, Jean has a question. Molly, yeah, what's the what's the time frame on the naming? Uh, well, we, it's not absolutely necessary to include the name and RFP when we have it set in stone. Yeah. Um, if we want to do a broader process, then we could put in a placeholder for the RFP. Um, it was more that we wanted to get ideas. Is this something, um, have, have we put a lot of thought in? Do we still need to do this process? Do we want to help walk through this? Um, maybe today we just go discuss the desired attributes, and then we... Um, go through this process offline and come back. Uh, so, uh, if the advisory group would like to take some more time, we can definitely include a placeholder on your review. So, so why are we asking this question? The reason we're asking this question is because once you get to the MyTech world and the names in it, it becomes remarkably difficult to change the name. Yes. And we're yes. finding this out with. Yeah. So on the Swedes project, right? So. We started it off, and that's why you can keep hearing us at the Sunset Heights, because that's what it started off. Mm -hmm. At some point in the contract, it changed it to Bluebird, and we all went, huh? You know, and and now that we've learned that that process is a bit of an um, administrative nightmare. Yeah. And yeah. so that that's why we're asking the question, is to, to go, yeah. we don't want to do that. Yeah, because I like the idea of, um, using the Stewart name, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I'm ready to move that we do that if at all possible. If they're agreed to it, well, let's let that. us see if we can. That's that's what I want to look at. Let us see yeah. if we can do. Yeah. yeah. 
So I, that's priority, if we can do that. I think that was kind of one of the bigger questions that I had was it's, you know, if we, are, are we really set on, on doing the blank out of the crossing with the other two properties there, or are we open to um, other things? I think that's like, the, you know, and obviously the Stuart family out with that, um, which is obviously fine, but I think that's a big decision point of if we're fine not following um, that pattern with the other two properties out there. I just know, just history of what we've done with them, they're going to want to be involved in that, uh, the foundation, and so they will give us their suggestions. Yeah. Can we accept it? Well, I mean, I mean, to give you a, to give you a sense, um, the value for um, the Stewart Auditorium on the museums was probably in the neighborhood of like five million dollars, yeah. or three million. I can't remember if it's three or five, but it's a it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Or you have the Kaiser Permanente room in there, which was just a room. It was a quarter of a million. It was two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. So you kind of look at investment and what what's the investment piece and things like that yeah. and knowing their interest they may go well we want to build a playground uh, okay. and so then we go okay you know if it's like three let's say three fifty four hundred thousand for a playground then it would be like you know the line of the Stewart playground mm -hmm. so that's the negotiation to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah it's so. okay. and then they may be have no interest in it. yeah Okay. What I'm thinking is if you're going with having a child care facility on site, you can't commingle light tech dollars with that. So mm -hmm. you've got to find gap financing and funding to go like commercial use. And if that's something that they want to contribute to, that fills that gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's one mm -hmm. way of looking. Yeah. I don't like the idea of using the facilities we've got um, and aligning with um, uh, you know, companies that are already providing child care and providing that transportation. Um, that would solve our loss of unit kind of issue um, and the net tech issue. Yeah. yeah, that was issue here. I mean, that's what you saw, I think, Longmont threw in our homecoming mm -hmm. into this one. No. And then I think we also had to use CBG yeah. funding to help bridge. Yep. Because the light tech wouldn't cover it, and so we were gap financing on this, and right. it, it it was a few years of back and forth. Yep. I don't even know what we ended up putting in. But it was, I don't want to know the cost of this building because oh. I just keep approving more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's a product of the market and yep. COVID. And Something that happened over the past three years. Hopefully, yeah. we don't go through this again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is, we'll include a placeholder, or you know, something basic for the RFU. We'll go through the exercise with the Stewart Foundation, see what we can, um, who we can get in touch with there. Um, I would like to know from this group at least get some feedback on the desired attributes for this property, because that could feed into the RFU as well. So does anybody have any thoughts on that? I do. If, if we're targeting families for this property, I think creating like a nice safe space that's internal for like a playground would be nice. Um, that way even parents can let their kids run around and not have to, you know, keep an eye on them if they're near the road and mm -hmm. worry about cars. Um, and then just having, you know, nice welcoming space. I think just welcoming and inclusive of all family types you know family we tend to think of people with children but not all families have children some families are a you know caretaker and an adult mm -hmm. sometimes it's an older parent taking care of a child with intellectual developmental and disability mm -hmm. so um, making sure that we're inclusive of all these types of families um. 
what about local conveniences, um, grocery stores, um, uh, in, all, of, all of that, the, the convenient uh, market, convenient, you know, convenient to um, the kind of things you need on a daily basis, a weekly basis? Yeah. Probably, <clears throat> probably one of the best locations we have. Mm -hmm. So you have Safeway across the 17th. Right. You have Walgreens immediately adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to see more restaurant development in, in Asking and Robbins. And, I mean, so yeah, there's yeah, probably right. more here than other places. Yeah, right. and it's like they're next to the bus line on Hobart. Right. So we have bus stops walking. Yeah, those kind yeah. of yeah. connections. Are we planning on doing like a neighborhood eco pass for our residents? No, we don't we do space. that. Um, part of the problem is, and this may be more conducive for it, um, if you don't live immediately on the line, and people don't use it. That's part of the challenge is the RTB system here is not good. Unless you're on Main Street or maybe 17. Family, we do the car share program there. So even families wouldn't have to own a car, 
they would just have to have a valid license and they could rent the car for dollars an hour. Yeah, okay. And the thing we've got to figure out too, so like when you look at Charge America or any of the apps, so like the one at Village Place shows us as a charging location for the public. And not Village Place, the one at Spring Creek or whatever, it shows up as a charging place for the public. We, we gotta figure that out yeah. in the sense of is it or isn't it? Um, and certain grants preclude you correct. from saying it's only for our residents. Right. Oh, really? Yes. Um, Depending yeah. on what grants you if you get grants to pay for it, there are certain requirements. Like the ones at the spoke, we decided because we're paying for the cost of the cloud and the maintenance, yeah. we're charging, I think it's a dollar, whatever you guys are, whatever the city sustainability coordinator said, like a dollar an hour to charge. Okay. Um, and then for our residents, we give them a code so they can charge for free. Okay. But that might be the way it goes. If, but if there's constantly people from the public in the spaces, your residents don't ever get to access yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a two-hour limit on these so that you can't just park there all day. Right. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, the nuances on the charging stuff is, is, you know, pretty. And I don't know how they funded it at Spring Creek and Fall River. We're going to have to figure that out. Because if they use other funding sources, then that were specific to sustainability or EV chargers, we may have a different issue on our hands. But we weren't involved in those, so we've got to dig. But it was a little free, they'll be in and out. <laughs> well, that's not, that's, I don't even think, that, that may not even be a level two. Yeah. And so, yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't yeah. think we're getting her, her desired attributes, though, so we should probably focus on the words. <laughs> Sustainable, <laughs> transportation oriented, mm -hmm. um, safe, inclusive. Definitely safe. Um, welcoming, which you have inviting. Mm -hmm. um, How about accessible? Accessible, yeah, especially if we're looking at the definition of what family means and what that includes and inclusivity. Um, and what's the, the newest one that we're trying to factor in is visitable, so that people can visit. Because if you live in a house that has steps up to the front stoop, but someone's coming in a wheelchair to visit you, they can't come in your home. So making sure units are visitable by people who need it. So not just who's going to live there, but who's going to come visit. Say that five times fast. It's <laughs> <laughs> not really words. So it's kind of hard to do. Yeah. Visitable. <laughs>
you know, rolls the rating, this is what goes to the top. Might be a better way to do it as opposed to everyone kind of just filling out theirs. Yeah. Um, just providing the names first and the rating comes in the secondary piece. Okay, I like that. something that, and I did a, interviews at three of the different places, so this is something that came up, and over the last year that I have been involved in this, I've noticed that, that it seems to me that, that, that things are just moving a little bit slower. Not having known what was done in the past, I, I had asked Jean to give me some feedback on what was done in the past as far as VIA goes. We were able to meet with VIA and uh, talk to them about, can we start this again? And if we can start this again, what are we talking about as far as cost goes? And what do you guys think needs to be done to get this moving forward? Um, they are definitely open to starting it again. And because we had suggested that instead of it being just, a, you know, whenever somebody calls in, they wanna go to the grocery store. This is really what we're looking at now is grocery store. And so, like Jean said, we do it a couple of times a month on the specific day, so it would be the second Tuesday of the month, always that day, have that day reserved for the different facilities, and we would determine what facilities are interested in doing this. So, what, Spring Creek, Ball River, Aspen Meadows, what we need to do is talk to them, and so maybe Lisa would you're setting up your meetings, we can kind of give us a couple of minutes to say we would like to have an idea of 
how many people would definitely be interested in this. It would definitely be a sign up, you know, so that VIA would know ahead of time. But if we reserve the day, we've definitely got the vehicle so that we are not going to be scrambling to say, well, gee, I'm sorry, you know, we thought we had the vehicle, but we don't. If we reserve the day, we've definitely got the vehicle. So if we started it out, and what we would like to do is we would like to get it started this year. So um, we, uh, and, I under, and I know that the budgets are already done for this year, so we will probably ask the city council if they can cough up a couple of dollars. Um, we sort of figured that probably $5,000 would carry us over. VIA charges $90 an hour, okay? And we figured that, just, just guessing, we figured that maybe six hours with a day um, would do it. So we based our budget suggestions on that. Going forward, because you guys are looking at budget, we were, we were thinking next year, same amount of money, possibly about 15000 And we're asking that because if this goes and goes really well, then we may go more than six hours a day. We may go seven and a half. We're looking at an hour and a half. So we would pick somebody up at Valley House <coughs> Meadows. We would take them to the grocery store, go back to one of the other facilities, and just continue in this way, pick them up, pick up bring the other ones back. So an hour and a half, we figured would probably do it, um, that we could, we could handle this. So just so you know, we've kind of set the thing and said, Via, can you do this? And they have the vehicles that could take 10 to 12. The vehicles are already here in Longmont, so we wouldn't have to worry about them coming from Boulder or Denver or anywhere like that. So that's kind of where, where we're at as far as, as transportation goes. So we kind of want to throw this out now and say, I think it would work. I've seen this work other places, and apparently it has worked here in the past before. So it's something that we kind of should. They have, sorry, I jumped in, um, ADA buses. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so what happens okay. with that? What happens with that is if somebody is in a wheelchair and needs to go, then that take that means there's less space for somebody else. It takes out two one. seats. Mm -hmm. Same with walkers, I assume. Yes. And walkers, yes. 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 It's, it's accessible with walkers, but the walkers we don't have. They they still have seats of it, more seats available. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the wheelchair, they lose two. They lose so, two, and so they wouldn't allow more than two wheelchairs per yeah. ride. So if there were two wheelchairs at Aspen Meadows, and then they needed more, they would just swing back around to Aspen Meadows and, and pick up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I work with similar programs, and I have like sign up sheets already. I have like. Mm -hmm. Bus yes. procedures, stuff like that. So yeah. the next step would be working more with Kendra and Via to get more information. Yes. Yeah, I think. Excuse me. There's also a registration process. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anybody that wants to needs to make sure they're registered with Via, okay. and that's a simple one page. Uh, that's probably for their liabilities, and I actually have liability forms mm -hmm. for my whole company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, we already fund Via through the city, and so. Not to be Debbie Downer, but I'm going to have to be Debbie Downer right now. Uh, incredibly concerned right now about the budget and the budget next year, mm -hmm. just because um, you know right now where where we are in the city budget, um, we're seeing the labor market move. So Towers Watson made a national projection of a 4.1% increase in salaries, salaries yeah. nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, the front range of Colorado tends to lead. Mm -hmm. That, where we tend to not be the bottom of the average, we tend to be on the top. And so, you know, generically, um, we're, we're now moving at box speed on the city side to understand that piece. Uh, because it is not beyond the realm of possibility to go, we're going to see somewhat of a five to six percent push in salaries. Mm -hmm. We then probably we paid 102 percent. So, you know, if we shift there, then that's almost looking like a seven percent increase in salaries. Mm -hmm. um, we already know that we're over budget on snow removal mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of these other issues, and and then. 
everything is going up in pricing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to say kind of what Kendra and I are going to have to do on budget is just to do our base level of services, we think we're going to be stretched. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be by property. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, um, AMA, AMA and in this property um, are not doing well in terms of the rents and everything else that we're bringing in. And so, just to say, we've got to keep that budget in the framework because um, I would caution against doing something that we're not able to do in perpetuity. Um, and we can't risk the foundation of what we're doing either. So just plug that in there. Um, everything that I was, it's, a, it's an interesting year for us. Um, and in terms of the city, you know, we're doing well. I looked at Jim yesterday and I said, do you ever think you have a budget where you're doing well, but then you're pushed? Um, and so I would say we, we need to be cognizant of that as we're looking at this because um, inflation is just a killer right now. Well, and just so you know that we didn't find anything. No, no, we, yeah, just, yeah. we just oh, talked. Yeah, we yeah. just talked. Yeah. Yeah. Just finding out. And it is critical. Um, I, I really believe it is critical to pay our people so that we can keep them. Um, because continual movement of, of staff is not good, and I think that that, that is definitely critical. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely. So, budget-wise for me, for those two days, how would the process work? Would it be where, do people have to register and say, I'm a, I want to be picked up this day, and then there's a limit of 10 or 8, depending on, you know, if they need ADA access, and then it would go to each property? They pick up, like, say, Fall River, Spring Creek, if they're not full, then stop at Aspen and get some people there. Drop off at Walmart, head over to the Holver Properties, Village Place, right. pick up, drop off, and then pick up who's ever ready to go back to their property and then kind of just do a big old loop around town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's six hours enough. enough. Well, so I feel like I've been grocery store forever. I was yeah. say, but I, I've been this living in Las Vegas, and I, we had a property with 383 units, and we allowed four hours for kind of a loop service. And as long as the driver's going in the loop and they have to take their 15 minute break, we could accommodate everybody new. If they were not back at the bus at the final pickup, and we would tell them, "You have to be back at this time. Meet the bus at this time. You're responsible for your own way home." Right. right. So. Right. And I've, I've seen this also work in, in places yeah. where I've been, so, and they have enough, you know, they know enough about it that they can, they can do it. Um, it's just whether or not we have funds to be able to kind of get this going. And we need to bring Phil Greenwald in because we need to understand what, because Phil works with Via from the city side, and there may be some overlap in this that he can figure out, but. That, and the other thing is finding out the interest level in each property because mm -hmm. it might be a property or two that they don't, they don't want to. Yeah. And that cuts down on and I hours. Also, yeah. also, the locations, like, because I know from what I've seen being at Aspen Meadows and maybe the over properties and the suites, they want more access to Walmart where they have grocery stores a little bit mm -hmm. closer to them, mm -hmm. but Walmart's a little bit further, especially like the over properties, the suites, right. and all that, they have to drive. Right. right, right, right. So, right. but well, we can start the surveys just to start. Right. Yeah, I have to get a visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we well, got to <laughs> and we got to figure out that as we add properties, you can't leave them out. Right, right. So then the the additive component, we got to figure out and how then. So if we're building the pro forma for when we take over Christmas. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll need to add those two in it, or mm -hmm. when we build the one and over. Mm -hmm. So the service is naturally going to expand. Mm -hmm. So we got to kind of think through that whole right. model of what does that look like. Yeah, but I right. think it's something we need to do. Um, I think to to your point about slow. I think the challenge that we we frankly have is that. Um, I think we're just now where we're stable financially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's the, that. the challenge and, and, and I will be my job is also to tell you and the board what you need to 
hear, not what necessarily we want to hear. Mm -hmm. sure. And I'll just say we need to kind of keep an eye on stability, and maybe we, we figure this out and go. We think in hmm, X number of months because you know it may be something we can do from the general fund as the development revenue starts cycling mm -hmm. in, where it's not property based, but it may be now may not be the exact time that maybe next year was be. We realize the cycle of the development revenues coming in from Christmas, and you plug the whole. I mean, there's all these things we've got to figure out. Increase. Yeah, okay. yeah. So just and know what we. Yeah, I know yeah. we're already starting to have um, rent increase talks because we haven't had a rent increase for multiple years, mm -hmm. and so we're looking at that and how some of these properties are really being affected budget year this year because the price increases that we're seeing. From the beginning of the year to now, even for appliances and everyday items, maintenance you know, is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And every time you go to the grocery store, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, well we're going up. Our suppliers are going up. The mm -hmm. signs that we used to buy for twelve dollars are now thirty dollars. Yeah. So we wanted to throw this out yeah. to you sure guys and, and so yeah. that you know it's something you can think about when you're building new properties. It's something that if there's a way that we could even start it this year, mm -hmm. the pan the pandemic we hope is, you know, sort of going away and people are starting to come back and wanting to do things and and so we'd like to help a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't even know what time it is. Um, okay. We don't have anything left to vote on anyway. Right? I don't think so. It's just reports. Okay. Uh, moving on to LHA report. Lisa, I think this is moving. Yes, the um, occupancy availability report is the first report. Um, we did have a little bit of June an increase in uh, our occupancy back up to 95. We're aiming for it to get to the 98. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping these numbers start going up even more now that we have a full maintenance team on staff. Um, everybody's back from medical leaves, everything for maintenance, so they're full going at it and getting these maintenance turns done. Um, these numbers are based off of June, so looking at the vacancies, some of these vacants have been filled, but there's been other vacants come up. I did add to the report, um, this is more for the um, Board of Commissioners, the City Council wanting to know more about the meth contaminated units and where we stand. Week 7110, um, the reconstruction of the unit is expected to be completed by the end of this month, early August. That was the one that's uh, a rollover from 2021. 7114, we just got the cleaning bids. They're starting cleaning today on that one. Is that a total clean? That one's um, actually, it's cleaning and um, ripping out everything that was coming down. That's the bad one of the suites. So they're starting that one today to start demoing that unit. 7330 was released back to us um, about a week ago, so maintenance is in there turning it, and it's already pre-rented. Um, resident hopes to move in by the end of this month. Aspen Senior, 305, the cleaning bid was just signed, and they're hoping to start on that at the end of this week, beginning of next week. F3 over at the neighborhood, the reconstruction is in process. They expect to be um, completed by the end of August, and that will be a manager's unit. So she will be moving from the suites over there. And then Spring Creek 106, that one was just released back to us. That unit just needed a light cleaning. Maintenance has already been in there, and that unit is rented as well. Can we back up a minute to Aspen Senior? That has happened since the remodel? Yes. Okay. And then we had two bad movements um, that's adding to the prolonged vacancy at some of these sites. The lodge, we had one that had um, Heavy urine damage. We tried to clean the flooring and everything, but it ended up we had to rip the flooring out, seal the flooring, and bringing on new carpet. Um, the carpet prices have doubled. So, mm -hmm. and then um, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, we had a three bedroom unit that was um, an eviction. They left it really bad shape. Everything has to come out. Carpet has to come out. Um, so maintenance has been doing that all in house, ripping out, taking all the furniture out, breaking it down, disposing of it. So that unit's taken a little bit longer than a normal turn. So with you guys being able to go in and do your, your yearly checks on houses, we should really kind of cut down on some of this? Yes, some of this will be, some of this, um, 
especially the housekeeping issues, stuff like that, we're trying to really bring in, work with many mental health partners as consultant, even when it's not one of their clients, even if it's at one of our other sites, they're willing to step in and help um, consult and work with the tenants as well. Um, I like this. I like the, the information down here. Yeah, part of it is, you know, so the AMSA um, MEP is a little bit different because there's probably a clear path to deal with that one because we remodel, renovate, and we know it's clear, mm -hmm. and then it's not clear. And I think that's part of on all of these issues. We're trying to figure out the accountability piece in the sense of, um, at what point do we go to war on these issues mm -hmm. and, and really set it up because, and it's not just meth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we had a unit in another property where it was massive amounts of animal feces. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are costs to these, every time there's cost to these issues that is incurred. And at the end of the day, you know, as I talked about this, last Friday, the issue that we're running into is, it's not just them, mm -hmm. what they're doing is impacting the ability of someone else to be housed because mm -hmm. units are offline, which is ultimately impacting the community. Mm -hmm. And so we are really trying to figure out what do we do to get a hold of this and really set expectations in terms of, if you do this, this, and this, Here's the accountability that's going to come with this, um, because we've got to reframe this. Um, on the yearly inspections, you know, we are probably, you know, we're touching a lot of budgets in these conversations, but it's probably easier to do that. So we're out right now for getting quotes on insurance. Um, we know the insurance is going to go up, um, in large part because of the, the, uh, the fire. We are incredibly concerned that we, um, as to whether or not we will continue to have um, our meth insurance, because more and more people are losing that. And so there are some really, you know, big issues that if they fall, it, it, it's going to create a different bunch of challenges. So we know insurance is probably going up, but if we lose, the meth insurance, then we're probably going to have to shift our, um, what's the account, the reserves, the, uh, the replacement reserves. We're probably going to have to, to really start amping up the replacement reserves because then we will have to call, cover all of these costs internally. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot of things that, a lot of dominoes that depending on where they fall, uh, I mean, it could very quickly put us in a negative position in the budget, which is, um, and, and there's no mechanism to absorb it. So if the budget at Spring Creek is doing really well, we can't use that budget for this facility because of the way you structure it in the deals. And so we're gonna have to start looking at all of these revenue sources based on the expenses within the individual properties. And it's even more complicated for the Lodge and Hearthstone because we have to anticipate that and submit it to HUD and they have to approve it because it is a 202 property. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think we're gonna have our work cut out for us. You mean continuing, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so any questions on the occupancy availability? So. I'm just, we're going to run out of time here, so can you just kind of give us an over real fast overview? Yeah, for the property updates, yeah. um, we still have our fair housing training coming August 11th, which is going to be big. Um, you all should have got advice for that. Yep. Um, let's see, we're still talking with insurance and attorneys on the best procedure, kind of like it was just kind of, and um, let's see. We have, I saw this on here, but a big thing that was started this week is um, we had a contractor come out and look at all of our ADA accessibility, UFAS standards throughout all the properties, gave us a very detailed list of what needed to be done. Um, 
we started on that. Um, Dave and I have gone through anything that was less than like hundred dollars to take care of. We've got it on schedule to get those little things done. A lot of them, even though they quoted us a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars to get them done, we can get it done with stuff we already have on hand, or it's just our guys moving the toilet paper wrap over, covering the hole. So we have all the supplies. We can do that in house. So we're jumping on that faster. Um, so that's a big thing. still dealing with evictions at all the units. Yes, right? I'm still in court every Friday. We're still only allowed two evictions for LA, well, each company is only allowed two evictions per week. Per week. So every Friday morning, I'm at the courthouse. Every Wednesday, um, we work with the Sheriff's Department to do, for those who we don't come to an agreement in court, or a mutual rescission is inside where the residents leave on their own, and we have to have the Sheriff come out. Um, those are typically Wednesday through Fridays, and we're on the sheriff's timeline, they kind of tell us. So it's a team effort that Sheriff was actually really impressed with us again of how fast LHA can pack up an apartment and get everything out within standards and codes. But my, my team has really pulled together on these. They get out there, we're out of property at seven o'clock in the morning, building boxes, getting ready. It's not what we like to do, but we, we do get in and get the job done and nobody complains, everybody just gets in and gets it moved. We did have to um, buy some more PP&E respirator mask, and um, we've always had gloves, so we got a heavier duty work glove um, pickers, because some of the stuff that we have had to um, move and touch, um, it's not friendly, and some of the smells in some of the units, um, I did have the staff under getting sick last week, but we think it was the heat more of anything, moving people out when it's 100 degrees out, it was not fun. So we did um, do that. A beautiful thing, um, Briarwood Veterans Community Project, who is leasing the old office space there. Just, um, we partnered with them and bought supplies, but they had a group of volunteers come out and redo the whole community area outside um, the awning, the ramp up into the awning. They have um, Veterans Community Project placed a barbecue out there, and they're inviting our residents into events with the veterans. So, they planted landscaping, really, really clean up the, Adrian Marriott out there. I think the, the only thing I wanted to add to this is I think what we're seeing when we tend to get into these evictions is, and, and we gotta figure this out, is I think we have a lot of people that move from single family <coughs> detached homes where it was your home and you could do what you needed to do, moving into a multifamily environment where they can't do just what you used to do and what you want to do because we're having to manage the entire facility, the livability for everyone in the unit and those types of things. And I think the crux of what we're dealing with is that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the lack of respect for the others in the unit because generally that's what I see as being the underlying cause for this. Um, and there's not a place that's immune to it, but you know, we're that's why we're using chronic and things like that because you know, it is here's your space, but even within your space, it's not completely a free for all where you know the spell the smells permeating the adjoining properties, the hallways, these types of issues. There are rules that are in place, and um. I think we're just going to continue seeing more of that. And one of the things we do have in place is um, we call it kind of the pause, and we've talked about it a few times, the housing retention team. If anybody, the manager, the resource specialist for the senior center, the manager, me, um, Susan Spalding, who runs the city mediation department, if any of us see something and we like, hold on, before this goes to court, even after it goes to court, we need to discuss this kind of a little bit more. What are What's in place? Who's helping this? Who's Who's all involved? And we've really had some successful ones. I actually had one that we had an eviction granted mm -hmm. um, two, three weeks ago. And we had adult protection services involved, and they said, oh, this isn't a case for us. And the son finally stepped in, and he's like, hold on, what can we do? So we all met. There was a group of, I think, seven of us in the room. We sat down. We kind of walked through a plan. The resident is now current on rent, um, paid all the attorney's fees, paid everything. 
the, the family step and the family's taking over the resident's financial situation to make sure that she doesn't end up in the spot she had ended up. She had the funds, she just didn't want to use them towards rent. So, but she's now, she's staying housed, she's not being evicted. We were able to vacate that judgment. Good. And we're doing that with a few. So we try to sit down with this uh, mediators. Um, we've had some come out from Bridge to Justice out of Boulder County. And we'll sit down and we'll kind of work through a plan, try to set up some um, agreements prior to court. And if the resident can keep up with the agreements, then we won't go to court and we'll vacate that as well. So, and But if they don't keep the agreement, if, it's, if they're causing a nuisance to their neighbors and say they keep on doing it even after the agreement signed, then we obviously still have to go to court. Okay. But, and I tell other residents, because we get a lot of um, pushback when we're doing the lockouts. And uh, last week, we, my staff kind of got a lot of hateful comments coming in and out of the elevator and it was a, a group of residents but we said it's not that we're doing this against this one person we're protecting everybody else in the building mm -hmm. from what's been going on and this, the issues that's happening because a lot of it's the smoking um, it could be harassing after hours during business hours but it's we're here to protect the other residents not this place for residents oh, okay. communication is and you know, it's like when you supervise people and you go into a disciplinary procedure, you know, it's not uncommon for them to go, well, you're doing this to me. Mm -hmm. And my answer is, I'm not doing this to you. I don't want to do this. You're pushing me to do this. And and that's really kind of the situation. None of us enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But you're creating a situation that's forcing us to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get a lot of chances. Probably more than you would get in any private multifamily uh, situation, which we get a lot of pushback on that too. People get mad because we're not dealing with it. Yeah. We're balancing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kendra, I think that you fast. <laughs> yeah, because I want to give people, if anybody wants to speak, yeah. I want to give them a few minutes. So really the accounts receivable, I just started looking at which ones are increased. You know, a lot of it's due to um, increased yeah. charges because of meth, because of tax due collections and people going to evictions. So that's kind of what's currently happening with the accounts receivable. For the financials, um, as you know, Lisa mentioned as well, we have communities, um, Aspen Meadow neighborhood, the lodge and Spring Creek with really high vacancy dollars mm -hmm. to where they're almost over budget for the entire year. So a lot of that is due to, you know, having units out for meth. Um, we have had an increased um, where tenants have passed away and in that case we don't have notice. So, so you know, we're not able to get it housed um, fast enough. Um, so, and with the short staffed um, in the maintenance department. So the unit terms were not. Um, happening fast enough because of the short staff. So that's that's kind of why we have high vacancy in those. Uh, we have three expenditure concerns. We have a little bit snow removal. Um, for some properties, we are over budget. Um, so we're praying for no snow in the winter months or the, the fourth quarter of 2022. Um, for others that aren't over budget, we may have one pool, so one snow event can happen. <laughs> Um, so that was definitely a learning lesson, and we'll probably have to increase that budget next year. Um, we do have an issue issue with our janitorial, which is, you know, our anticipation was to take our janitorial in-house. So we could have a staff member here four hours a day, you know, at all of the properties, and we are just having a really hard time um, actually finding somebody you know, to fill that so we have a third party that we're actually spending money towards and it's go it's beginning to go over budget because that's obviously higher than what we had anticipated with the staff and benefits and then the other one is background fees um, I don't think they were doing them as thoroughly as we are today um, so we didn't budget enough knowing that that was happening <laughs> um, but we have some things in place to limit some of that um, but we'll need to increase our budget next year for those background, you know, whether it's um, for criminal or, or um, employment, 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 employment industry. So. Yeah, it's primarily the HCP. Yeah, it is primary, yeah. but there are some other properties that are have high costs too. And we're, we are seeing, an, um, I'm starting to see a significant increase in lawyer costs too. 
to all those. With that said, usually those costs get transferred to the tenant, but in hindsight, probably won't be because we won't get paid. And, and that's a critical point because what we're seeing are what our HUD obligations and, and what we need to see and what we need to report. So um, we we have three cases that I'm going to be meeting with over the next week. One um, owes us twelve thousand dollars in rent. The other, I think, owes us eight thousand dollars in rent, and another one is around six thousand. So I'm getting in. In rent or owe us on the HCV piece. So um, I told Tracy anything over $5,000, I want to have a conversation with her because we also have an obligation. We have, in addition to those three, we have turned over one to the Office of Inspector General um, because technically those are felony um, cases and um, what they owe. And, and so our obligation under the HUD rules is to make sure that we're in compliance with the rules, that people are providing us with the appropriate documentation so that we can assess whether or not we're giving them the right amount of money. And when they don't do that, then it is our obligation to follow up on that, whether it be what they're paying in rent or what we're giving in vouchers. And so um, we are probably stronger than the housing authority has ever been. And, and we're catching them and we're moving on them. And so we're having some conversations with HUD. We're thinking a little bit about going in and saying, here's what I need you to do, similar to evictions. You owe us 12,000, here's your payment arrangement, here's what you're going to do. If at any point you default on this, we're immediately turning it over to law enforcement, whether that's gonna be local law enforcement or the Office of Inspector General. Um, because if we don't do that, then we jeopardize all of our federal funding that we have in this. And, and so I know a lot of people don't like the bureaucracy that comes with this, but it really is ensuring that we have the funds and we're using the funds appropriately so that we don't jeopardize those funding sources into the future. Considering that you have not been able to do anything for about two and a half years as far as evictions and stuff like that goes, I'm thinking, I'm just guessing that that's why your lawyer fees are so high now and eventually they're going to go down. Yeah. Hopefully. Assuming that their rates don't go up, like every rates are going <laughs> up right now. Anyway, I mean, it's, you know. And I back that part of this because nothing was done for two years. So right. when others fed off of others bad and right. they're like, well, nothing's happened to them, I'm going to do it too. Yeah. But I think as residents see us taking action now and actually going to court and see these people vacate or being forced to vacate, mm -hmm. that is going to make people reconsider their actions and yep. make our lives a little bit easier. I agree. And, and so, you know, the tangible effect is generally what we're seeing is the call for service for police and fire is down, mm -hmm. uh, drastically down on all the properties. So we're seeing some immediate impacts, but it just takes us a lot, I think, time to get to a more permanent and lasting impact. And, and so we used to have, um, when I started at the end of 2020, I, I think on an average week we could have 20 to 50 calls a week. Mm -hmm. Now, max a week is 20. And those include welfare checks, medical calls, um, fire, fire department coming out to help people out. So that includes everything. So the actual police calls have gone way down significantly. Good. Maybe one or two a week. Good. Uh, good. Okay, yeah. So. The voucher thing is. Oh, <laughs> I thought about the voucher thing. Um, so, yeah, vouchers, that's just kind of a, you know, we're still at a study. Mm -hmm. We can't ever seem to get over our hump. Mm -hmm. um, for some odd reason, there there are more that lose their vouchers than we can get back. I mean, we've almost exhausted our entire wait list. Um, and a lot of people that got on the wait list mm -hmm. were hearing nothing from them. Right. There's no responses. So, they've either moved out of the area because it's too expensive to live here. Um, or we had a lot of, you know, outside, you know, a lot of different states, you know, trying to get a voucher here in Colorado. So we're still working. Um, they've sent more vouchers out. They've sent, you know, we have several, several people looking right now that are still in the process. Most of them have had, had two or three extensions on their voucher because they just can't find 
um, landlords or places that they can accommodate the cost um, with what we're allowed to give them um, for fair market price. So um, it's a struggle for sure. We do, we are looking, we are um, looking or talking about, we have additional PVP vouchers, um, because, but because we're almost maxed on our voucher count right now, it would have to be kind of on a one drops off is looking at some of the properties like Village Place and the AMSA to put PPP vouchers in too. Because those are the two that don't have any that might help boost up um, some additional funding for those properties. Yeah, so that the residents who have lower AMIs because as we're looking at the rent increases, we're actually looking at the household incomes and what what percentages are in the building versus what's actually living there. So we're looking at that and you know project based vouchers could help potentially village place residents and the asset value of senior residents. And part of what I'm going to do is we're building a data analytics group. And one of the things that, so I know that when we look at the people that have vouchers in Longmont, they tend to be over half, we have a lot of over housing partners, there's a lot from the county that have vouchers here because Longmont's the most affordable place. So I'm going to get, but puts it in, in inverse pressure on us. And so I'm going to work with our data analytics group to try and get a sense of, you know, what vouchers are we seeing in Longmont? Who are they from? Where are we seeing the voucher spread throughout the entire Boulder County? To try to understand what that push and pull is going to be, and maybe create a maybe I need to have a conversation with Boulder and the commissioners to go. We need to start spreading these out because now we're just running out of places here for our voucher holders because of the amount of vouchers we're having coming in. But um, Kendra didn't have time to do it, so we'll bring in some of our data folks to sit beside her and, and do some of the studies. That's that's really a you know a, a pure analytical look at this to figure out what is the push and pull in it. Do you want to say anything more, or, or I'll just open it up for anybody who'd like to speak for a few minutes? We just have Good. seven minutes. Lori, <laughs> did you? So we've got seven minutes. Um, if anybody wants to just say something while we're here, um, raise your hand. Tell us who you are. We've gone a little bit beyond our time here. We appreciate all of you being here. Nobody has anything? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just get, did I hear that some people who have not paid their rent, I mean, it's been up to 6,000, 8,000, 12,000. So it got, caught, it got caught in the COVID issue and the non eviction. Get so you couldn't evict during that time, which let those numbers grow. And there are several actual tenants that even had high balances, but they were able to get rental assistance through the programs that were um, available um, through Boulder County and other agencies. So I, it could have been much more that was going to eviction, but they were able to get on top of it with that additional assistance that was released. All right, if there's nothing else, it's just you and me, so I guess we're going to adjourn. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next meeting is 16th of August.